Welcome to Hip Hop Now Podcast. If you're from the future, you know what to do. Get your ass out of here. Don't disrespect the legend. Hip Hop is here to stay. Let's get right into the business. What up, y'all? I am your host, Vegas, and this is Hip Hop Now Podcast, a podcast specifically designed to keep you caught up on all things hip hop, music, and culture that happened throughout the week. Big shout out to the supporters over at patreon.com slash hip hop now. And if you would like to become a supporter of this podcast in that way, you can visit the link, not visit, you can visit the link in the description of this very episode. Also, also, please know we are headed down the road to 500 subscribers right here on the YouTube channel. Uh, If you've been listening to the audio version for years, the link is in the description of every audio version of this podcast, which is available from Apple Podcasts to Spotify and all that. All you have to do Look in the description, click the link, and become a subscriber to this channel because we're trying to get to 500 right now. We are at 416, so we're making some progress. At one point, we had we were at three something. I was like, yo, if we could just get to 400, we got to 400. Then I'm like, yo, we need to get to 500. Now we have 416, right? So, baby steps. I'm cool if I don't go viral and get a crazy fan base, it would be nice. But what you can do for me is if you enjoy this kind of content, this kind of hip hop talk and engagement, right? Because I respond to y'all in the comments. The most important thing you can do beyond subscribing and obviously hitting that like button so more people can find it is sharing it with others on social media. Because honestly, that's how people find you really in a lot of ways. Now, there's a lot of people who found me through YouTube. That's just as dope. But if you're on Reddit, if you're on Discord, if you're on Twitter, we know it's called X, but we call it Twitter, right? (laughs) If you're on Twitter, Instagram, whatever, and you like an episode or you really think other hip hop heads should know about it who don't know about it, share it with them. That's the best way to support, honestly. And it costs you free 99. Okay. I am a big supporter of podcasts. I listen to a ton of podcasts. I watch YouTube like it's television. So I do what I'm telling you to do, but I'm asking you to do it for me. So wrote the 500, help a brother out. I really appreciate it. Big shout out to hiphopdx.com and probably just them uh, because this week, if you can't tell visually, if you can't tell by the title of this episode, Dungeons of Rap, if you can't tell by my shirt, right? On video, Large Professor, DJ Premier, Pete Rock, LES, and who at the bottom? Hold up, who at the bottom? L Maddox at the bottom. Um, If you can't tell, What's Behind Me, the vinyl of uh, Illmatic, as well as the cassette tape, the original cassette tape that I bought back then in 94, right? No, no reissue. We real out here. We real. We was outside, 9-4. You know what I'm saying? No, he ain't give me a copy for those who ask. Uh, <laughs> It's 30 years of Illmatic. So this show is going to be peppered with Illmatic. Let's get right into the business. If you've been sleeping under a hip hop rock or you from the future and you already know, you already heard the album, get your ass out of here. But if you don't know, Nas and DJ Premier announced on April 18, uh, 2024, that they would be dropping a new single. Uh, entitled Define My Name. I think that's what it's called. Forgive me. Define My Name, right? And social media was hype. Y'all know how y'all do on Twitter. 
Cats is debating back and forth. And the biggest debate was whether or not we want to hear uh, new Nas and Premier, specifically an album, right? But they were announcing a single, so there's all kinds of speculation. And um, Nas even fanned those flames uh, on one of his joints with Hit Boy, where I think it was Magic 3, where he mentioned, like, you know, a, a, he teased a premiere album possibly, but we have um, been here before, if you don't know, as far as teases of a Nas and premiere album, right? The most famous tease was the Scratch Magazine cover that had Nas with the army fatigue on, black fatigue, and had premiere in the background. And when people saw that, and all the illmatic nostalgia just took over and they just like, oh, yo, we need it, you know, for the culture, do it. Well, now that this single has dropped, and I'll tell you what I think about it, um, they have also announced that Nas and Premier are working on an album together. Now, the first single, like I said, is called Define My Name. And I'm going to just tell y'all, I'm going to just be real. I've always been skeptical at this point of it sounding as good as I would want it to sound as a fan of those two collaborating with each other. Um, and last year during 50 Years of Hip Hop, uh, they did this compilation. Well, Master Pill was doing these compilations because Swiss Beats did one where certain producers work with different artists to commemorate 50 Years of Hip Hop. So Premier did one. He did the first volume. And um, it was a couple of people on there, like Joey Badass and um, uh, I was going to say Rod Digger, but not Rod Digger. Remy Ma was on there, you know, like I think Remy Ma and Rhapsody had a song together, if I'm not mistaken. But also Nas and Primo had a song called Beat Break. And that was the first time in a long time Nas and Premier did a song together, right? Now... Uh, Premier was in the video for Wave Guys, but he didn't produce the beat. He just did the scratches on it. Uh, Wave Guys was produced by uh, Hit Boy. You thought it was Premier, but it wasn't. Give Hit Boy his flowers, man. Stop playing. Um, but, you know, it was a dope record, and people just still wanted the hip hop head, still wanted that collaboration. Well, I'm here to say that why I was skeptical was because that beat break song just wasn't good to me. Like, it just wasn't a good pairing. It wasn't whack, right? But I'm a spoiled hip-hop fan, you know what I'm saying? I grew up in the 90s. I was there for the park jams in the 80s as a little kid. I've followed along. I've done hip-hop radio. I rhyme myself. I DJ. Like, I've done all of it. So I'm kind of spoiled when it comes to hip-hop, right? Especially from these two. When you remember, like, New York State of Mind and New York State of Mind Part 2 represent, you know, Nas is like, like, they, they've done some magic. And Premier, in the later, uh, his later years, his, his formula started to sound the same. And Premier, back in the 90s, all his beats never sound the same. Just never. But after a while, you know, as time went on, a lot of his production just had the same flow to it. Like, you could hear it before it even happened. It was the same rhythms, um, which isn't always a bad thing, right? People have styles, but that premiere wasn't that. That's not even how he got his name. You listen to J. Rue, the Damages album, it's a variety of beats on there. Same thing with the Gangstar albums and the Group Home albums. So it just felt like, it felt like DJ Premier didn't have those different styles of beats anymore it was it wasn't as varied as it used to be it was just always you know it's premiere because it sounds like this right um and i'm not counting that one which was dope that one joint that that nas was on that premiere did but i think rock was on it also it was like sneak commercial something like that uh which was dope but again People were clamoring for a Nas and Nas on nothing but premier productions, like match made in heaven kind of situation. And after that break beat joint, I was just like, nah, I don't think I 
I don't think I want that. You know, it's not necessary necessary considering what Hit Boy just did with Nas. Hit Boy helped as as producing him, not just making beats, but producing him. He helped bring Nas up to prominence. They dropped six albums. And even though Magic 2 is my least favorite, it's not garbage to me. Like, that's a hell of a run. That's unprecedented, okay? So I'm just was not, I wasn't mad if they wanted to collab on a song or two, but I wasn't anticipating it, right? Uh, but I was always going to listen to it because why not? It's Nas and Premier. Why wouldn't you listen? Well, I said all that just to say, Define My Name is dope. And what's dope about it, honestly, is Nas. Because it is the premier formula, especially when it starts. It's the, it's the scratching you know, it's the signature sound. And, you know, at first I was like, well, there's, there's a sound. You know, it doesn't sound terrible, but it's predictable. But when Nas starts rhyming over the 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 uh, the verses or whatever. He when he starts rhyming, you hear a little bit of the old flow mixed with the new flow, and it's all in pocket things he's saying. It's it's exactly what I want to hear. I just want Premier when this album come out. <laughs> I just want Premier to reach for other sounds the way he used to. I don't want a ton of joints that's had that you know scratching different names and words like give me a couple of those on there no i'm not saying don't give me a couple of them joints but i i want him to really get in his bag like he used to i want the same way hit boy inspired nas to get back in his bag i want nas to inspire premier to get back in his bag because if you listen to that beat and you say to yourself but this is what he do you don't know premier's production you know why? Because we can start talking about premier tracks from Gangstar to J. Rule to Biggie. To, they don't sound the same. Unbelievable sound nothing like DeWitt. Sound nothing like Mass Appeal. Sound nothing like New York State of Mind. You feel, you feel me? <laughs> so premier is absolutely capable of giving you variety. He just hadn't done it on a consistent basis to me. Recently, even though that joint he did for Benny and what's Benny's crew, BSO, something like that. Um, that joint was crazy. And I was like, yo, premier back, like, yo, I'm a hip hop head, so I'm th all you gotta do is show it. It's like boxing, right? Like with this Jake Paul, Mike Tyson thing. And we're not gonna spend a lot of time because we got other stuff to talk about, but like with this Jake Paul, Mike Tyson thing. There's a part of me that feels like it should not happen. That is, he is not fighting the Mike Tyson I grew up watching. The man who became the man who we know today. The mystique of Mike Tyson. Too old and I don't want to see that. But if he shows a glimpse of old Mike Tyson, then I'm back. I'm back in the bag. Like, yeah, get him. Get him, Mike. Like, so this is what, that's what I want for Premier. Now, the album... And this was a little disappointing, but maybe this is what they had to commemorate 30 years of Illmatic, um, that this was clearly felt like an announcement song more than anything, which is cool. It might be on the album as a bonus, but as you could tell, it's not necessarily a song for an entire album. It's literally like we back, we back together. And I'm not going to lie, at the end of the song, you know, now it's like I'm in album mode. Premier sound kind of um surprised on that track when he said <laughs> when when Nas said that. Like, oh, we 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 doing an album? Oh, okay. Now we don't know when this song was recorded. We don't know how far along they are until they start talking about it. If they start talking about it. So hopefully we get to hear a little bit more about that album, but they said later this year. I, I think at this point, I can't see. It would be highly disappointing if it didn't come out because let's be real, a couple of these legendary artists, especially those who have teased really dope records. I'm looking at you, LL and Q-Tip. 
you know, you don't know when the album's coming out. The song was hot. You tried to make it an exclusive and nobody listened. Um, Red Man been talking about Muddy Waters 2 forever. Ghostface don't talk as much about it, but you know he working on a Supreme clientele too. Cats need to be more like Raekwon during the pandemic. He said, you know, you got to complete the trilogy so there'd be a Cuban Link 3. Also, I'm doing a um, album rating list of Raekwon albums, you know, so check for that soon on the channel right here on YouTube. Subscribe. Hit the bell to find out more and get notified. That's all bars. Uh, so I'm I'm optimistic, man. I like this joint. You know, it's it's not it didn't blow me away or make me extremely thirsty. But what stood out is Premier is just gonna have dope beats. Doesn't matter if the formula is the same or it's variety. He's just gonna have dope beats. But at the end of the day, as long as Nas is in the pocket, it it won't matter because mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what we want you know um and it'd be dope if on this same album you know we get a pete rock joint and and a large professor joint it at least uh we probably won't get a q-tip or les but um it'd be dope if they did that or if they just did like a song that had a bunch of uh beat flips um definitely get az on it because you know we, we talking about that but we'll talk about illmatic a little bit later Lupe Fiasco challenges MCs to battle again. A video surfaced, and when I say video surfaced, it's not like it was some secret or nothing. He was at the stage, he was performing, and he just wanted to let it be known. He wants smoke with everybody. He was naming people like, yo, I'm out here. Y'all battling while I'm out here too. <sighs> but Lupe Fiasco. And, and let me just say this. His fans came, came up. Yeah, you know, my man want that smoke. Who want it? Kendrick, you don't want it. Then Lupe goes on to say that Drake is a better rapper than Kendrick. He said Kendrick is better technically as far as his technique. But Drake's the better rapper. What Drake say? Shut your whole ass up. Sorry, family podcast. We get, but we we gonna have to let that one slide. Just tell your kids, you know, um, it was about a water hose and a donkey. Okay, there you go. Uh, but th this is why I say that, and I and don't get me wrong, I'm not a Lupe Fiasco hater. I own albums from Lupe Fiasco because I am a fan, and he is a worthy challenger. But he's been hating on Kendrick Lamar for as long as we can remember. And every time he gets a window of opportunity, he wants to say something, right? Now, some people will say, yo, it's hip hop. You know what I'm saying? Then take the challenge. But that's the thing, right? It's sort of like me going outside and arguing with a bum about our place on the sidewalk. He like, I live here. I'm like, I'm trying to walk through. Why am I arguing with you, man? I, brother, I'm going to just walk in the street, walk around with you. Why? Now, is Lupe Fiasco a bum? No, but he looks like one when you are practically begging others to battle you. Now, if somebody disrespects you, go in. You Lupe, go in. But asking people to battle you, I just always think that's corny. Jim Jones did it a couple of months ago, and nobody even cared. Now everybody trying to battle everybody. And it just made me think back like, damn, Jim Jones, you was asking people. You went on a campaign, and nobody responded. Same way with Benzino, right? He coming up with all kinds of ideas. Eminem, what if we both battle underwater with a shark and blah, blah, blah. And Eminem is like, I say what I want. And I don't acknowledge you. <laughs> and people are like, oh, I would really want to see that. Why would you want to see Benzino battle anybody? If you don't like Eminem, you don't like Eminem. But don't act like Benzino is the guy to battle Eminem. Like, if Eminem has a problem with someone like a Styles P or Jadakiss, then I'm like, hmm. <laughs> you know, what you going to do, Em? But Benzino, come on, man. Let's stop being enablers 
of trash. And Lupe, when he does this, he just cheapens who he is. And when I say he's a hater, this is why I think he's a hater. We all know it. Kendrick is the artist that Lupe wanted to be. And I'm not talking about just music. I'm talking about the reception. Kendrick is commercially accepted. He's popular, right? And he doesn't have to compromise his lyrical integrity and he makes what he wants. So it could be conscious, it could be anthems, it could be storytelling, it could be different flows and styles and techniques and blah, blah, blah. And he's successful at it. Lupe is kind of like the same artist But when he tries to go and do something with more substance, people didn't pay attention uh, because of how he was announced. Or not how he was announced, but how he debuted, right? His debut was more um, commercial in a lot of ways. And not in a bad way, because I like that. I love food and liquor. Um, But it was more on a commercial level as far as the music. And then he's kind of gone, you know, that to that to the cool, which the cool is more like, yo, that's a hip hop album. That's more like an underground album. And that same audience who was introduced to you one way is not going to get into that. So some people tapered off and then he did another album and that was more on a commercial side and it just seemed schizophrenic. And I know some of it had to do with his label situation. So he wasn't necessarily always creating a type of music uh, he wanted to. You know, um, but Kendrick had the freedom to do him and it was highly successful. And when you see that you're trying to do something in a specific way and it was nothing but brick walls for you or the audience didn't respond in the way you thought they should have. And now this dude come along and he's kind of doing a lot of the same things, but he's way more accepted than you are. What does it boil down to? Well, it boils down to personality right people just like kendrick also (laughs) some people don't like you lupe and you doing things that make them not like you because they look at you like oh look at this cat like i know dudes who were huge biggie fans who was not feeling ray and ghost taking shots at biggie and ray and ghost obviously were dope cuban link classic but they just did not like they didn't even want to hear from those dudes because they looked at them as hating like yo you doing that and that's dope why you looking over here you gotta be hating and that's where you know play a hater not just for them but uh play a haters anthem or whatever that was called um and uh the mad rapper like that's where all those things came from because dudes were just mad like yo How is he doper than us? Why is he more successful than us? Why is he getting more money than us? So they find things about you to say, you know, you ain't got, that's not real. That's what haters do. Look, I didn't hate it on people too. Like you just don't, you know, I don't like this. I don't like if he didn't do nothing to me, but I don't like his face, (laughs) right? Whatever. Uh, Not saying it's right, but that's the thing. So I kind of feel like with Lupe, I'd rather him I'd rather him say something like that and release a dope album now. Now you're talking. But just to say it because you see all these battles going on and you're trying to insert yourself. Like everybody's trying to insert themselves because they know what it means at the end of the day. Streaming service don't uh, uh services don't pay a lot for streams, but you know you can make money off of certain things. This is why Benzino is practically at this point begging Eminem to collaborate with him right you know he he challenges him to we can battle face to face live and when nobody bites on that then he's talking about it'll be good for hip-hop man shut up please like come on man find another revenue stream if people don't care about your music or or anything you're doing at this point in time but your daughter's popping Mend your relationship with your daughter and find a way to assist in what she does 
and maybe you'll find business in that way because i'm not saying he broke i don't know what he is but sometimes you can see the desperation in dudes on different levels i'm looking at you dame dash where dame dash ain't broke but you could tell he want more and it probably hurts to see his man's his former business partners getting way more than he's getting right now and then that's why you go on a tour of speaking to everybody about your business so enough of that and lastly so if you do not know and somehow you fell asleep at the wheel when i started this podcast this episode Today is the 30th anniversary of Illmatic. Illmatic was released on April 19th, 1994. It was Nas's debut coming out of Queensbridge, no pun intended. Um, and most notably, the buildup was kind of crazy, right? Because at the time, the Source magazine was literally the source for hip hop. It was like, if you go to social media, any platform to find out what's happening, or you come to this podcast to find out what's happening, the source was like, this is where you go, right? To find to find everything, reviews, what to think, new verses, whatever. And Nas, as a rookie, had, you know, a hip hop quotable. He had an article leading up to his album release, which at the time showed us that he was working with some of the dopest producers in the game. Um, and it wasn't just the fact that he was working with various producers. It was like it was the cream of the crop. And they were excited to work with a rookie. Large Professor, Pete Rock, Q-Tip, LES, DJ Premier. Supposedly, Eric Sermon was supposed to be a part of it, but he fumbled the bag on that one. Maybe he could do a beat on a new premiere joint. I don't know. I know y'all want it to all be premiered, but sometimes they don't do stuff like that nowadays. Uh, who knows? But that that built a, a intrigue into Nas where for people who didn't know, they was like, yo, who is this cat? Right? Now, some people knew because you heard Nas on Large Professor's uh, or Main Source's debut album on the song or the the name of the album for those who know don't know because yo oh head slow down everybody here don't know everything okay there's kids watching and there's older people who are like what's that hip-hop about so we gotta tell them right <laughs> large professor uh his debut album is a part of a group uh main source called breaking adams but the song now this was featured on was called live at the barbecue um he had a notable verse a standout verse with some intrigue was there on that then you saw Nas again on uh mc searches uh song back to the grill again you know finessa keep a tech nine in my dresser lyrical professor keep you under pressure like ooh, it, it was already getting kind of crazy we was like yo who that right that's how people felt yo who that um and then um then the zebra head soundtrack that featured Nas's first song and video shot in queensbridge of course called halftime a lot of people thought that was dope so he was getting around and you know the source magazine it was a lot of build up and then the source gave it the covenant five mics which meant it was a classic album now imagine that it's your rookie season and you win MVP and a chip and all uh defensive play everything you you damn near win every award in your rookie year like you up next you the goat you the heir apparent to cool G rap and rock cam it's you and I just remember at that time like it illmatic was just impacted everything everybody everything rate from from radio to you know magazines and all of that now illmatic did not go platinum back then because as big as illmatic is now as far as the mind share of people in hip-hop rated because it's it's the it's the holy grail to, <laughs> to people um 
it did not show that in sales because honestly, when it comes to successful products like music and film and stuff like that, it's not just the hardcore that has to buy it. You need the casuals to get on board also. And the casuals usually, usually get on board because there's a catchy record. And the single was It Ain't Hard to Tell, which was a dope intro because it was just a dope display of Nas's lyrics over uh, the human nature, Michael Jackson sample. It was, it was a perfect rollout. It just felt like, man, this has happened a couple of times in hip hop um, and not with everyone. Not with everyone, but it just felt like there is a new tier of MC happening and everybody has to raise their level of artistry in order to, to match that tier of music. So Illmatic was, was just one of those joints. And like I said earlier, you know, original cassette from back in the days, it is beat. It is beat up all crazy, but it should be because it is 30 years old. Hold on, I'm trying to get myself right on the, <laughs> on the video. Um, some of the things I remember being said about that album back then that people don't even say now is, yo, it's crazy, but it's too short. Now, not, not short, dog, but too short. Uh, in length, pause. But uh, it was because it wasn't because of well, it was two things, right? The amount of songs because I think it was like what 10, 10 tracks on here, yeah, and one was an intro, um, and the the I did it even clock in at an hour? I don't even think it was an hour. Um, so there were a lot of people who that was the knock on Elmatic. And it was mainly because they just wanted more. And at that time, having more people had tons of records um, on one album. You know what I'm saying? So people wanted more. And they knew back then he wasn't dropping another album, you know, a couple of months later like they do now or sometimes a couple of weeks later. Um, usually you were waiting a while, you know. For Nas, it was only two years in between, but there were times where, you know, an artist would drop an album, you listen to that album for probably three, four years. Um, now it's different. So a lot of people felt like, damn, you know, we, we want more. That's all. We just want a little bit more. And um, I think I felt the same way. Now, my, my connection and my story, if you don't know, to Nas and specifically Illmatic is a little bit different. And uh, one of the things that makes it different is for those who don't know, my cousin is ill well. My aunt is Miss Versi, um, which is my mother's sister. I spent so much time in my youth traveling to Queensbridge on weekends to hang out with my family all the time. Like it's, I'm from Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, but I feel like there's a part of, because I, you know, we were so close. Cause you know, I, you, you have cousins, you know, you got, you got your cousins who are like, you know, this my, my brother, my family. And then you got them like, we're related, right? <laughs> this was different. You know, my mother and her sister were very close, obviously. Um, well, now, obviously, some people don't have that, but, you know, uh, they were very close. So we were always over there and they were always at our house. So, you know, I, I grew up around Queensbridge and, um, you know, this is this is my cousin's friends, Nasia, who lives, you know, on the fifth floor right below my aunt. So obviously I knew him and other friends just by being around. And, you know, when he was killed in 92. You know, I have a I have a bunch of, you know, I have episodes where I talked about it and I've been on other podcasts where I talked about it. But, um, you know, that was like a crossroads for a lot of us. And I came I this wasn't like a conversation that was had. It was just that. I know the way I was, I kind of kept to myself, but mentally I changed the way I looked at life and I focused on school 
as my way out of a situation that just felt like we all were statistics waiting to happen. Um, and I, you know, looking at articles and stuff like that or interviews from Nas, it was a lot with him. But for him, he was going the path of music. You know, I got to make this happen, especially because Ill Will was there when he was grinding. He was there for live uh, live at the barbecue and all of that for the recording. So it's, it's just one of those things where this album was kind of like a signal of, of a traumatic experience for me. You know, something that I didn't share with a lot of people. I remember in high school, I remember when 94, when Illmatic dropped and my man Reggie, rest in peace, I remember he like hunted me down in the hallway like, yo, tell me you heard Illmatic. And I just didn't know what to say because part of me wanted to share with him you know, uh, my connection, but part of me didn't because I didn't want that attention. And I started hiding it for years. I started hiding my relationship to all of it for years. And I just couldn't enjoy it in the same way I enjoyed other hip hop classics. Now, obviously, eventually <laughs> I enjoyed it like everybody else, but that moment when it dropped, uh, it was just different for me. And I, I just couldn't, you know, take that away because first of all, this is a guy who I'm around all the time who's now a hip hop star, right? Um, but also at the same time, knowing how much uh Ill Will wanted to be in hip hop, it was just sad that he wasn't there. So there was a lot of emotions attached to trying to enjoy Illmatic, and obviously I got there. Uh, but I just remember, like, I remember going to Queensbridge when Illmatic dropped. And when I tell you, <laughs> you walk into the project, somebody got their window open, they done put the radio, it's not even summertime really like that. They done put the radio in the window and they just playing it on repeat. Like the whole project is going to hit all Illmatic all day. If you're from the projects, you know, especially back then, I don't know what they do now. But back then, you already know that's what it was. You walk in a building, you hear somebody blasting it from outside their still door. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And it was just it was just everywhere all over those projects. Um, and a couple of times I remember uh, Nas coming through right after that. I saw him several times um, once Illmatic was uh, like that. I'll give you a couple because I don't want to make it too long. But... I remember one time, you know, he just came by the crib, uh, my aunt's crib, and uh, I happened to be there. And he just hung out with me and um, my little cousin, um, Kennedy, right? It was little brother. Um, and even then, I just felt some kind of way because we're, you know, we're in Will's room. And, you know, you could tell they ain't teach us how to mourn, y'all. Like in the, in the ghetto, sometimes you ain't got your father around and. Sometimes your, your mama too stressed trying to take care of y'all. So, you know, things get missed, you know, and it, that's cool. Uh, but there was another time he was around and I was going to college and um, my aunt Versi was like, yo, uh, come by, have some money for you for when you go to college, right? I was getting ready to go away. So I, you know, I go to her crib and we getting ready to walk to the train station or wherever we was going. And who's there on the bench, you know, um, outside the building with a couple of dudes? Nice. And, you know, we telling him, yeah, I'm, I'm going to Morgan. You know, I'm going for this and that. And he's like, yo, that's what's up, blah, blah, blah. Now, I went to school. I went to Morgan State uh, 1995. was my freshman year. I didn't know, and he for damn sure ain't say it <laughs> in the moment, that he did homecoming the year before I got there, which was crazy, which was probably, you know, somebody looking out for me because God forbid he would have did homecoming in 95 while I was there and I would have been on stage and you, you go to college, you was fresh me and you already know how it could get, okay? And we ain't even just talk about the ladies. It's, it's a lot of you hang around dudes who just would have been like, oh, where are you? What you got? What you know? What you... So, so again, getting back to Illmatic, it was 
a, a strange situation for me personally, but at the same time, I was able to recognize what he was doing and how it was impacting hip hop and other people. Now, in the description of this very episode uh, is a link to a chapter of a book I wrote called Experience Hip Hop. The book was about or is about me buying different hip hop classics and where I was in my life at that time and basically recounting like what I did when I went to purchase it in some instances. And I talk about Illmatic and that link is in the description of this episode. The book is basically a couple of different albums. So before that, the first chapter was Ice Cube's Death Certificate. If y'all know me, y'all already know. I'm going to wear the shirt one day on the show. Um, but was that bars? No. Uh, <laughs> but the latest chapter, chapter two, is uh, entitled Represent. And it's about Illmatic. And I just want to leave y'all with this. You know, I want to pose a question and I'm going to tell you what I feel. And you put what you feel in the comment section. We could chop it up. Where is Illmatic? in the history of hip-hop as an album like like where do you put it now i know some people say yo it's number one some people say Nas is number one i remember doing the show strictly hip-hop shout shout out to big uh b more and um we did an anniversary show and we had mc light uh on an interview and i remember and i've said this on the podcast before she was asked what's the greatest hip-hop album of all time and without hesitation she said Illmatic and that caught me off guard and this wasn't 1994 we talked about this was years later like way later and we talked in this MC light and without hesitation she was like Illmatic off the rip and I thought that was crazy because I, that I wouldn't call Illmatic the greatest hip hop album of all time because I think there are a lot of albums that as a whole or or better produced and i'm not just talking about beats i'm just talking about it's an entire experience when you listen to this album right so i feel there's a lot of albums that do more illmatic was just kind of like which is dope because it was raw it was just yo it's nas and his raps and dope beats and it's something special to have people uh, not only call it a classic, but consider it the best of all time when there's so much, there are albums that have so much more to them than that. Like I said, with Death Certificate, um, it's just so, it's just way more production going into that album than Elmatic. But Elmatic's impact is the lyrics, which is, I mean, <laughs> you can't argue that. Uh, me personally, I I still feel it is one of the greatest hip hop albums of all time, um, hands down. It should definitely be top five or top three, and I think what it did for people was it's not about the street lyrics for those who tune in and have never heard it and uh just like i don't i don't see what's it's not necessarily about street lyrics even though that's it's it's how nas conveyed those stories he put words together in a way in the same way as a as a poet right with a lot of reflection on things that some people would consider normal right some people would say you know we in this building on the staircase and that's that's it for the visual side. But Nas basically found a way to bring all the characters from the hood together in the situations and things like that, where you can visualize what he was saying by the words he used. Um, again, I talk about it all the time. New York State of Mind feels like New York in the early to mid 90s, right? It felt like a turning point. Before stuff like Illmatic, uh, New York specifically, East Coast hip hop was very playful and wordplay and, you know, DOS effects and blue cheese and even tribe. Like it was just a different, it was more fun. You know what I'm saying? And it was, it was more, it was less about 
what was really happening. You know what I'm saying? And Nas on Illmatic was a reflection of what the world was today for him. And let's be clear, with everything being said about this album, people considering it greatest of all time, mainly because of the lyrics. The beats, are, don't get me wrong, the beats are classic beats, some of the dopest beats ever in hip hop, but mainly because of what he did with the lyrics. And this man was a teenager. He was a boy. Because you look at it when it came, when it came out, oh, well, he was, no, when did he write it, man? He been wrote some of this stuff. He was a teenager who hadn't graduated from high school. And he was rapping like this. So that's what my appreciation is. It's, it's about the maturity of a project by a kid who has to grow up too soon. And I feel like a lot of us black young men in the hood, even to this day, have to deal with that and women, but have to deal with that. And this was kind of a, a reflection, uh, a diary of, of a person who was paying attention to everything around them beyond glorifying some things that some people would consider ignorant. It's not about glorifying it. It's the fact that it was our world. It was our reality. It is still the reality of many. And Nas did an excellent job of basically being no different from what they, how they said the Star Spangled Banner was wrote, right? Like, which I always was like, what? Uh, but I get it. You know, oh, bombs going on outside, blah, blah, blah. And somebody in there pinning bars, like, you know, the Star Spangled, I'm going to call this the Star Spangled Bat. You know, like, oh, they, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If that's the true story, I don't, I think I remember that, but who cares? So, what do you think about Nas's debut, Illmatic, 30 years later? Were you around for that? You know what I'm saying? Were you outside? Did it come to you a little bit later in life? You know what I'm saying? Maybe you heard it today for the first time. Leave your comments in the comment section below. Also, trying to get to 500 subscribers, man. We we making some progress. You know what I'm saying? We have 416 trying to get to 500. So please subscribe, hit that like button, and share with people you know enjoy this kind of content. Also know that if you do podcasts in audio form, I got you. It's on Apple Podcasts. It's on Spotify. Just search for Hip Hop Now Podcast. Subscribe and stay locked in for more hip hop content. Until next time, y'all. I'm not a critic. I'm a fan. Peace.